I am Professor Sanjeeva Padumadasa of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, Sri Lanka. Today, I will demonstrate a second stage cesarean delivery, an operation that is associated with considerable maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. The incidence of second stage cesarean delivery has increased over the past few years, mainly due to the decline in the rates of instrumental vaginal delivery. A caesarean delivery in the second stage, when the fetal head is impacted in the maternal pelvis, is challenging due to the risk of extension of the uterine incision into the cervix, vagina, posterior uterine wall or broad ligament and also due to possible damage to bladder, ureters and bowel. The fetus also can sustain injuries such as long bone fractures, skull fractures and scalp lacerations. A second stage cesarean delivery should be undertaken by the most experienced obstetrician. Informed written consent should be obtained, highlighting the surgery's inherent risks. Prophylaxis against acid aspiration should be administered. Blood should be grouped and saved. And the neonatal team should be informed. Catheterization of the bladder is difficult due to the impacted head and pushing the head slightly upwards will help overcome this. The operating table should be at a slightly lower level than normal in order to facilitate the performing of maneuvers which may be necessary to disengage the impacted fetal head. The lower segment of the uterus will be stretched and distended. Therefore, both the skin and uterine incisions have to be made at a higher level than normal. This would be approximately 3 cm above where a normal uterine incision would be. The normal landmarks that help to differentiate between the uterine body, cervix and vagina will be obscured and one should not mistake the upper vagina for the lower segment which might lead to an abdominal delivery through a vaginal incision that is laparoelectrotomy. The uterine incision should be curving upwards on both sides. This should minimize the risk of extension of the incision to the uterine vessels. Once the uterine incision is made, the fetal shoulder would pop out and with the lyco having drained out, the uterus would more or less be hugging the fetus. One would feel pressed for space. There are a number of techniques which are commonly used to deliver an impacted fetal head. These are 1. The standard technique of delivering a fetal head at cesarean delivery but with few modifications. 2. The push disengagement technique, also known as head first technique. 3. The pull disengagement technique, also referred to as feet first technique. Let's look at each in turn. Between uterine contractions, when the uterus relaxes, one should insert the dominant head to the lateral aspect of the pelvis because that is where one will find some space as it is the transverse diameter that is the largest 
at the pelvic inlet. There will virtually be no room anteriorly. The fetal head is grasped in the palm of the hand and with the operator's elbow, forearm, wrist and hand working as one unit, the head is flexed and delivered out of the pelvis, mimicking a shrugging movement at the operator's shoulder. Grasping the wrist of the dominant hand with the other hand is helpful. One should avoid levering movements at the wrist joint, which would cause damage to the thinned out low segment. In this method, the woman is placed in lithotomy position. An assistant gently pushes the fetal head upwards using the palm or cupped fingers. Using the palm or cupped fingers helps to dissipate the force on the fetal head. The assistant should not apply direct digital pressure on the fetal head. Meanwhile, the operator should apply traction on the fetal shoulder and then elevate the head towards the uterine incision. As a flexed head would present the smallest effective diameter, both the operator and the assistant should attempt to flex the fetal head. The pull disengagement technique, known as a feet first technique or reverse breech extraction, is safer and also easier to perform than the push disengagement technique. Here, the operator's hand is advanced to the upper part of the uterine cavity. And preferably both feet should be grasped. with the operator's middle finger between the ankles and the fetus is delivered as an internal podalic version and breech extraction. One can distinguish the foot from the hand by the short, almost equal digits with no identifiable separation between them and also the prominently palpable heel. Once both feet are grasped, traction should be applied parallel to the axis of the legs. Traction should not be applied perpendicular to the leg as this may cause fractures of the tibia and fibula. The feet are brought through the uterine incision and then traction is applied on the calves the thighs and then the buttocks. The fetus is then held by the hips with the operator's thumbs on the sacrum and the fingers on the iliac crests and the abdomen is delivered. Delivery is completed using Lovs' manual. And the Morisosmeli VA manual. If only one foot is grasped, traction should be applied on that foot until the other leg appears. This leg is then delivered by flexing the leg at the knee. Delivery is completed as described previously.
if a hand is brought out accidentally during the procedure, one should not attempt to replace it as it is difficult and also traumatic. One should ignore that and proceed to grasping of a foot. If there is a need to extend the train incision, a J-shaped incision is preferred. over a T-shaped incision because it heals better and carries a lesser risk of uterine rupture in a subsequent trial of labor after caesarean. Fetal head elevators which take up less space than the operator's hand have been used to lift the baby's head out of the pelvis. Similarly, Various devices which help release the vacuum between the impacted fetal head and the maternal pelvis are being tried. In Patwardhan technique, the baby's shoulders and arms are delivered first. Followed by the chest and abdomen. Then the buttocks and legs aided by fundal pressure by an assistant. Finally, the head is lifted out of the pelvis. Once the baby is delivered, it is handed over to the neonatal team it is advisable to exteriorize the uterus. It not only enables one to inspect the uterus in its entirety for any trauma, but also helps to reduce the blood loss. One should be mindful about tears in the posterior wall of the uterus and broad ligament hematomas, which could easily be missed. An oxytocin infusion should be commenced to counteract the risk of postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony, which may result from a prolonged labor. Broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics should be administered. It is good practice to leave the urinary catheter for longer than usual in order to prevent urinary retention as well as visacovaginal fistula, which could occur as a sequel to prolonged labor. In summary, appreciating the difficulties of a second stage cesarean delivery, optimizing access into the maternal pelvis when its space is obliterated by an impacted head, and being familiar with a range of options to deliver the fetus will help one to perform a second stage cesarean delivery safely. Direct involvement of an experienced obstetrician, both in the decision-making process and conducting of a delivery in case of non-reassuring fetal status or delayed second stage is of paramount importance. For a trainee, practicing on mannequins is vital in order to acquire the skills required to manage a second stage delivery. For a detailed description of second stage cesarean delivery and other difficult cesarean deliveries, please refer the book Obstetric Emergencies, a Practical Manual, the link of which is given in the description below. I hope you found this video on second stage cesarean delivery useful. Thank you.